In today's video, we have a few signings to discuss, plus some offseason rumors concerning teams like Vancouver, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Vegas. We'll jump into all that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. Now, as I mentioned, we have a variety of things to discuss today. First up, I want to talk about that Martin Hansel apparently is not going to be returning to the NHL. Not a huge surprise. He's been out of the league for some time. He's basically retired, uh, but he won't formally announce his retirement because he's technically still under contract on long-term injury reserve. Um, but his back apparently is what his main health issue that's kept him away from playing. Uh, I've seen reports that uh, his back is in pretty good shape as long as he doesn't play, but I've seen other reports saying he he may be playing in some type of league in Czech Republic, but it's not a professional level or something to that effect. Anyways, either way, he won't be back to the NHL uh, and will officially be retired once his contract expires. So no huge surprise there. I think we kind of all figured that Hansel likely was done at this point. Now, we also saw an update uh, regarding Dallas Stars defenseman Roman Polak. Doesn't sound like he's going to be returning to the NHL as well. He's apparently signed a contract to play in the Czech Republic for the following season, and it doesn't sound like he wants to return to North America to participate in the playoffs with the Stars. I'm going to show you a screenshot of some quotes from a recent interview with Polak here, and we'll kind of read through it, but it doesn't sound like he's overly eager to return at all. Uh, basically, at this point, he said he found himself thinking at times on the bench, what am I doing here? I don't want to be here. Uh, also, after Stephen Johns returned, after being away for about a year and a half, uh, Polak was told that he and a veteran Andre Sekiro would basically be rotating one game at a time, one in, one out. And he also basically said that he does not want to return uh, for the playoffs. He doesn't feel like a two or three week training camp would be enough time for him considering the layoff. He feels he would need much longer to get himself ready and get himself in shape. Otherwise, he'd be risking injury. Um, and basically said that if he's absolutely forced to, he will return to the Stars and uh, be on hand for their playoffs. But uh, Jim Nill was asked about this as well, the GM of the Stars. And he said this is the first he's heard of this, uh, that uh, he wasn't aware Polak would be signing over in Europe. Uh, in that he's talked to him in recent weeks and wasn't told any of this. Uh, and uh, he's on to say that basically uh, that they wouldn't be forcing Polak to come over, that if he wants to stay home, that he would uh, have that option to do so. Uh, Polak's agent, Alan Walsh, was contacted for comment, but either couldn't be reached or didn't want to provide a comment on the situation. So uh, Roman Polak's NHL days, at least for now, appear to be over, but I'd be surprised given the later stages of his career that he actually returned and signed a contract. But kind of surprised to hear that he did not have a good experience in Dallas and just kind of found like himself that he didn't want to be there anymore. He was a pending unrestricted free agent, so they can't stop him from signing over in Europe uh, for next year or beyond. Um, but a little bit surprising to hear how things were going in that regard. Now, the Buffalo Sabres also announced a signing today. They signed 2017 third round selection. Oskari Laxen, who's a right shot defenseman from Finland, so he's now under contract. I would imagine he'll play in Europe next year. Uh, more than likely, a lot of these European born prospects are likely won't be venturing to North America with all the uncertainty around the minor leagues and if they're going to have options to play and how that's going to work or the NHL season is going to be delayed uh, into the later part of winter or something. So, with all the uncertainty, I would imagine, like I said, all these guys will be staying in Europe uh, whenever possible so they can get on the ice because European leagues will be starting up in the fall at this point at least, uh, as they normally would be. Now, as I mentioned as well, we have some off-season rumblings around a handful of NHL teams, including the Vancouver Canucks, who we touched a little bit on yesterday. Obviously, the Canucks are going to be an interesting team to watch this off-season. Uh, they have a lot of tough decisions to make, some key restricted free agents, as well as UFAs, and that they'd like to re-sign, uh, and they're going to have some difficulty doing so without making some other moves. The Canucks are a team, I think, will be quiet in free agency, but I don't imagine will be quiet on a trade front. I think if they want to keep some of the players that they'd like to, they're not going to have any choice but to make some trades and to free up some room in other regards. Uh, so like I said, I expect Jim Benning to be somewhat busy, just not in free agency. Now, today's information comes from an article on Sportsnet, a mailbag article from Ian McIntyre, where he's asking some questions around the Canucks. Uh, one thing that I found interesting was his take on what it's likely going to take the Canucks to sign UFA Tyler Toffoli, who's had a solid run with them so far, had 10 points in 10 games leading up to the pause, 
And with Vancouver participating in the 2014 playoff format, it certainly will be very interesting to see if he can continue that hot streak and keep things going because there appears to be a lot of mutual interest on both sides to be able to re-sign him. But as I mentioned, certainly some cap challenges will present itself to make that somewhat difficult. Uh, in McIntyre's opinion, it's going to take probably a five-year deal around $5 million per year to sign to Foley. So uh, as much as that seems like a pretty reasonable contract, if he can keep up the type of production that he had in a small sample size, and if he can get back to consistently doing that, which would be comparable to what he did a few years back in L.A. before his struggles uh, started to become uh, apparent. But obviously, like I said, the Kings as a team were struggling too, so you can't put all that on to Foley, but it clearly had an impact on his overall production. Um, that very well could work out to be a pretty decent contract longer term but challenges like i said will arise obviously it's not clear if the nhl is going to be granting compliance buyouts that would be uh like a, a miracle for the canucks because they could certainly use that on players like louis erickson or brandon sutter for example especially in erickson's case where he has two years left at six million uh, as i mentioned in yesterday's video erickson will become easier to trade once the signing bonus is paid because there's not going to really be a lot of physical money left on the deal obviously a team acquiring would have to have the cap hit but uh, it's certainly not a lot of cash so there's a few teams out there that might be appealing to but not really clear what they'd like to do here in this case i'm sure they'd like to shed the contract uh there is some talk in this article they wonder would the uh, canucks and erickson be able to work out some kind of mutual agreement like we saw zach bogosian in buffalo where his contract could be terminated and he could become a ufa not really sure i mean once the bonus is paid Maybe, but he's almost going to be leaving money on the table, so he's going to be confident he's going to get another contract. This article also goes on to talk about the RFA situation, which includes defenseman Troy Stetcher and forward Jake Vertanen. Now, as we mentioned, the Canucks likely are going to have to make some trades, free up some salary, and obviously trading some not-so-great contracts might take some sweeteners, and maybe a guy like Jake Vertanen might be one of those players that's included. I know he's been a kind of player in Vancouver through his young career that's kind of been up and down with the fan base. Uh, not really sure that he's lived up to the hype of being a high first-round selection but still he seems to be getting better each year put up 18 goals this past season uh, so there would be more trade value now than there ever has been and they do have a pretty good uh, deep group of forwards that they could technically afford to move on from Jake Vertanen but at the same time you have to be careful with some of these young players you don't want to move on too early so that you don't miss out on their best parts of their career and maybe could be a bigger part of the team's future than some might realize but given the fact that he's an rfa he certainly has more negotiating power here with a good solid season to uh to finish up here but at the same time he doesn't have arbitration right so he doesn't have too much leverage uh, you might be able to get him on a pretty good contract that might make things more manageable to keep him but you could consider trading him as well if it means being able to retain guys like Markstrom and Toffoli was certainly going to be, uh, you know, top priority. If you're a Canucks fan especially, love to hear from you. Would you be open to trading Jake for Tannen if it meant being able to re-sign Tyler Toffoli? And do you see them being able to move on and shed that contract of Louis Erickson in some capacity to help relook after all these other UFAs that they certainly want to keep? Now, as I mentioned as well, I want to talk about the Winnipeg Jets and their, uh, it seemed like they're an ongoing search for a solid, consistent number two center iceman. Now, a couple of years back at the trade deadline, they acquired Paul Stastny at that point, who was acquired from the St. Louis Blues, and he fit in great. But the problem was, is even though he played well during the regular season remaining and into the playoffs, they just couldn't afford to keep him. Vegas was able to offer him a little more term and more money. He took that opportunity uh, to go there. Obviously, a lot of appeal to go play in Vegas as well. Uh, and he's, you know, done pretty good there but this past year was a little rougher on him than his first year uh stasty found himself playing third line minutes at times production was down a little bit but still not too bad and vegas has a pretty deep group of forwards as well so certainly competing for ice time uh, you know, at one point, it was more consistent, at least, that he was playing with Pacioretty and Stone. And they very well might get back to that. I guess we'll see how this playoff run goes. But there was another mailbag type of article where a Jets writer was asked what they thought about the possibility of reacquiring Stastny, if that's something that he's seen happening, uh, to maybe fill that void a little bit longer term. But given the fact that Stastny only has one more year left on his deal, is 34 years old now, not really sure long term it's a terrific solution, but he was a great fit there. He did waive his no trade clause to go to Winnipeg before, so he might be open to doing it again if Vegas were to approach him on a trade. But at the same time, these guys are somewhat rivals in the Western Conference, so you don't always see a whole lot of trades happening in that regard. 
But at the same time, uh, some of these teams might be in somewhat desperate situations when it comes to the salary cap. Vegas is certainly tough, off, tough up against it compared to a lot of them, and they might not have a choice if they have a buyer, even if it's a division or conference rival. Um, so Winnipeg might be you know, in that market. But at the same time, you can't help but think that they probably would want to get a guy like Jack Roslevic in return. And the Jets, I'm not sure if they really want to move him. It might make more sense for them to keep grooming him to become the number two center because uh, I do think he has that potential and can live up to that hype. Or if they did make the acquisition of Stastny, they may have to look to shed money in other ways. Maybe like a Matthew Perot, for example, uh, or Brian Little, or somebody else might have to come off the books in some other capacity here to free up the money. So as much as it might be a, a little bit of a nice thought to bring Stastny back to Winnipeg and really fill that number two center spot, because he's probably done the best in that role, even though it was a short sample size in the last couple of years. I just don't know, given the age and the short term left on this contract and what they'd have to give up with a rival that it really seems doable. But wouldn't be shocking if Vegas goes down the road, possibly of moving a guy like him, though. As much as he's been a good fit there, uh, they are tough up against the camper and they're going to have some tough decisions. Uh, I don't have any solid rumors to say for sure he'd be on the trade block, but they're likely going to have to move some money out. Then who's it going to be? Well, it might be the guy who's got the one year left on his contract and uh, found himself playing a little bit more lower in the lineup than they might have been expecting him to. So we'll see. We know Vegas is not afraid to make the tough decisions. We saw them fire coach Gerard Gallant. Uh, obviously, George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon said they're not afraid to make those hard choices, and we'll see what happens with them as we get into the playoffs and once the offseason finally kicks in. Now, as well, I want to talk about the Edmonton Oilers. There's been a lot of talk in trade rooms around defenseman Chris Russell for really quite a substantial period of time. It kind of started not long after they signed him to his current contract. The last couple of years, been a lot of talk around this player. And as the younger Oilers defense prospects have been working their way up into the lineup and certainly being able to take on more minutes and play bigger roles with the team, there's certainly a little bit more of an increased possibility he could be moved on from. And now might be, and this covering offseason, might be the best time they've ever really had for a potential trade. Once Russell has paid his signing bonus this summer, then he's only going to have uh, $1.5 million left on his deal. I believe the bonus is $1 million. Uh, so with a year left and a million and a half in actual cash being paid out, that might not be too bad for a team uh, who certainly has the cap space and somebody who might need a veteran guy just for a year to kind of be like a placeholder, uh, fill a gap while some of their younger prospects continue to develop. So it wouldn't be shocking if the Oilers are able to maybe make that happen. I know they've had a lot of younger defensemen like Ethan Bear and Caleb Jones, for example, take on bigger roles they got guys like Evan Bouchard is going to be looking for a roster spot next season and it certainly could make a guy like Russell expendable as far as teams who might be looking to make the acquisition I would look to teams like I said with more cap space and are rebuilding maybe a team like Ottawa Detroit uh, you know maybe a team like New Jersey for example they could all use some veteran help on the blue line as I said on a short-term basis while their younger players continue to develop so certainly a situation worth watching Russell could also become a potential buyout candidate especially if they go down the route of compliance buyouts with the league this summer so I guess we'll have to wait for more information, but certainly a situation worth watching. I know in regards to Edmonton Oilers prospect, younger defenseman, we did get word that defenseman Dmitry Samarankov is going to be heading to play in the KHL. Again, like I mentioned before, with all the uncertainty around the American Hockey League and different minor leagues around North America, not sure if they're going to be able to operate on time or how that's going to work. Likely not going to have a regular start to their campaign this fall. Uh, it's important for him to continue developing. Uh, so he is going to play in the KHL next season as much as they'd like to keep him in North America just doesn't make sense. We also get confirmation as well that Philip Roberg would be remaining to play in Europe as well. He is going to wait another year before coming over, but it just doesn't make sense for any of these European prospects. If they need to be able to play, and if they can get opportunities between the European leagues and the KHL uh, come this fall, then it's in their best interest and the NHL team's best interest to let them go and continue having them develop rather than sitting around waiting because we don't know how things are going to go when we hit September, October, when we normally have training camps getting started. So a lot is all for today. Let me know your thoughts and opinions and everything discussed, and we can continue the conversation. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing and turning on your notifications so you don't miss any future content, and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.